everybody, welcome to The Wild Doc Way. I'm Jessica, and today's video is actually a collaboration with another homeschool mom where we are both going to be answering the top 10 frequently asked questions that we get when homeschooling an only child. So when you're done watching my video, make sure you check out the description where I will link Nikki's YouTube channel so that you can see her answer the same 10 questions. Now I actually helped come up with these questions about a week ago and haven't looked at them since. So we are going to be answering this on the fly. So you're going to get my open, honest, real answers. Question number one, what are the biggest challenges you've faced homeschooling an only child? I think probably the biggest challenge or the biggest like con for me has been other people's opinions. Um, it seems like homeschooling an only child is not the same as homeschooling multiple and nine times out of 10, I'm constantly am getting like feedback from other people and even more feedback than like the typical homeschooler. Like if I'm with a group of homeschoolers and um, other people find out that we homeschool, as soon as they find out I have an only, they're like, but wait, what about this? Or what about this? And so that's annoying um, and can be challenging, or at least it was the biggest challenge in the beginning because I am a people pleaser and I had a really hard time like standing my ground and saying like, look, you don't know my child. I know her best and this is what's best for her. That is now obviously my standard answer. I've been doing this long enough that that's no longer the biggest challenge, but it definitely was in the beginning. Like I had to learn to have tougher skin, um, let things roll off my back. Remember that maybe the pediatrician or the optometrist or the people at the soccer field or karate or whatever um, didn't know my kid nearly as well as I did and that their opinions really didn't matter. Now, I would say the biggest challenge is probably um, juggling the, the social calendar. Uh, Emily is very outgoing and extrovert where I'm introvert. Um, so meeting her needs socially, which we absolutely do, um, can be a challenge for my personal personality, but we make it work. Question number two. How do you ensure, ensure your child has enough social interaction and builds friendships? When Emily was younger, like when we first started, I let other people's concern about socialization totally like jade my thinking or cloud my thinking when it came to socialization. And I was like, we're never going to be able to get enough. And I, I made it a big deal because other people made it a big deal. So we tried co-ops and I don't know how familiar you guys are with our channel and with our family, but we live an hour from civilization. The closest co-op at that point was like an hour and a half away. Emily was five. It made for a very long, miserable day for us to drive an hour and a half, do co-op for me to teach, for me to try to like juggle and pack lunches for us. And then for us to drive an hour and a half home. And it was a nightmare. Everything about it was miserable, not the co-op itself, but just the way that it worked for us when she was five, it was too much. Um, and then I immediately was like, okay, well, if we're not going to do soccer, we have to do all these other things. So we tried gymnastics and soccer. And or if we're not going to do co-op, we have to do other things. So we tried gymnastics and soccer. And um, I think cheerleading dance camp thing. And I like put her in all these activities only to have a miserable worn out kid. And for me also to be very miserable and worn out. Um, and exhausted and feel like we weren't actually ever getting any learning done because we were always on the go. So needless to say, after a lot of trial and error, uh, we found kind of what works best for our family with where we live and with you know all the obligations that we have. And that is that we allow one to two like outside things at a time. So Currently for Emily, that means karate, which is twice a week and it's two to three hours each night. Um, and then archery. So she does 4-H archery, um, which is once a week for practice and then a whole weekend when it's archery um, shoots. And then um, we do archery as a family in the 4-H off season. So that is what works best for us because we like not being like on the go all the time. It gives Emily the amount of social interaction that she would like that makes her happy that, um, 
that she thrives on, but it's not too much for me as far as like the driving and me being an introvert. And it also gives her um, a little bit of downtime and time at the house to do school and other things that she enjoys outside of activities. That has been the perfect balance for us. If you're a homeschooling only child and you need some ideas, I will leave a ton of blog post links in the description um, where I have ideas that you can look for, like 4-H, wild and free groups, things like that. If you need ideas to help your only child with socialization or to put them in things. 99% um, of Emily's friends have come from some sort of event. She either met them at archery or she met them at karate or um, she, you know, kind of like that. I would say the other 1% of her friends, like the ones that she's had over and over and over and that she's kept throughout the years have been where me and their mom were good friends um, and her and the child are friends because of that. But that's been like 1%, I would say, like I think two, maybe three of her friends are because me and their parents were friends and then you know she's friends with them because of that. All of the rest of her friends have come from some sort of activity where they've been at the activity together, they've met, they've hit it off, and then you know we've made arrangements for them to get together outside of those activities. Question number three, how do you handle boredom since you can't just say go play with your sibling? Oh, goodness. I have a lot of things um, kind of on hand for that because especially, I thought it was bad when she was younger, but it's actually gotten worse as she's gotten older. It's like the creativity and the imagination is blocked sometimes unless you get it rolling. Um, so I kind of have a standard like, have you been outside? Have you created something, you know, like with Legos or with art or a craft or whatever? Um, and then if she's still staring at me, like she doesn't want to do either of those things, then I will hand her a single player game and say like, hey, why don't you see if you can do a few of these like challenges? Because a lot of our single player games have challenges that like build on themselves. Um, and then my last resort is typically a discovery deck, which if you are new and don't know what a discovery deck is, it is something that I created where there are like either questions or activities with a QR code. And when you scan the QR code, it goes to a YouTube video. So these, this particular one that I just grabbed is our brain break and exercise movements. So like if she's just like, I'm bored and I've tried, you know, like, hey, have you done this and this and this? And she's still staring at me like she's bored. Then I'll hand her this and be like, hey, why don't you go do this Minecraft fitness run? And when she scans this, It'll be a YouTube video that pops up and then she like runs along in the Minecraft world to do that. Some of them are also um, like questions. So they're like five and 10 minute videos like this. Are there really birds that can talk? So they're educational videos. So I always feel zero guilt about being like, hey, go get five or 10 minutes of structured educational screen time. Uh, question number four, do you worry about them learning without other kids also contributing to learning discussions or team projects? I don't because we do things that incorporate other kids um, in discussions. The main one being her online book clubs that she takes once a month with Mary Hannah Wilson. Those are live on OutSchool. So she does the book club and the kids get to discuss and talk about their different feelings. When she was younger, before she started doing book clubs, she was in a Lego club that met weekly. Um, and those were fantastic because they had like an idea of what to build. And then when they got done building, all of them shared their builds and got to comment on that. Like, oh, I really like what you did there. Or that's really cool. Maybe you could try this next time. So we've always had her in some sort of online class, probably since I would say maybe first or second grade, whether it was out school or the Lego class or now the book club. I don't do a lot of things at once, but we always kind of have one thing going on every homeschool year so that she is still getting like peer discussions. Um, not that I don't, not that I think you can't homeschool without it. Like you totally can and you can do it successfully. I just always love the idea of her getting the ideas from other kids. Like when it came to Lego and book clubs, like those are things and point of views that maybe I don't have. And so I wanted her to have other point of views outside of just myself. Uh, question number five, how do you handle teaching subjects or come across 
or when you come across projects that require group work or wider discussion. This is part of the reason why I started to create our own unit studies because there were kind of a lot of things when we first started that were like, you know, a group of five or six or whatever. And it was very frustrating to not be able to complete the assignment or the discussion without more people. And so that's kind of why I started creating our own unit studies because then I knew like oh, I wasn't ever going to need more people than that. Um, if it is something, for example, we recently were talking about debates and how you know, two different people would debate and somebody outside of that was like a neutral party would decide who would win. Then I incorporate um, Kevin, like I'll bring Kevin in as a third party. If I need even more people than that, our grandparents are always on speed dial, both sets, and they are amazing and they will participate anytime we need that. So that's what I would do. Question number six, are you jealous of family time subjects that you see in bigger families? Not anymore. Yes, I would say there was times and there have been times in our homeschool where I have seen, you know, like the larger family doing things or it being cozier or, you know, teaching multiple levels. And I'm sure that when you're the parent teaching the multiple levels, you're like, oh man, I wish I only had one. It, the grass is never greener on the other side. So yes, there were times when I was like, oh, I would love that. Would I have loved it? Yes, that wasn't in the cards for us. Homeschooling and only was in the cards for us. Um, and now I have learned to not let comparison be the stealer of my joy and instead embrace the positives that come with homeschooling and only. So no, I don't get jealous anymore. Now I look at the positive things like, oh, because we only have one child, we can go on month long road trips and, you know, just basically wing it because there's only three of us and it's easy and I don't need, you know, two hotel rooms and all of this. So I look on the brighter side instead of the darker side, I guess. Uh, question number seven, what advice would you give to other parents considering homeschooling their only child? Um, I would say know your why. Like when you go into homeschooling your only, you should know your why no matter how many kids you're homeschooling, honestly. But when you're homeschooling and only, you really need to know your why. You need to be pretty firm on like, this is what's best for my kid and I know my kid best um, because that is going to make you more confident and it is going to help when all of the people come at you because they're going to. And it's gonna, I mean, it's gonna happen no matter what, but it happens so much more when you're homeschooling and only. Like the socialization question, so go ahead and form whatever response you're gonna form. My standard response is, that's funny because in my 13 years of public education, I was always told that I wasn't there to socialize. So obviously that's not the place to learn socialization. And that's just kind of where I leave it. Um, I don't even get into the whole, I don't think you socialize kids in that kind of way, but that's neither here nor there either. But that would be my advice is like, go ahead and form your standard response to socialization because that's going to be the number one question you get from outsiders. Know your why and be really firm on that. Um, and at the end of the day, just remember that like, you know your kid best, you know what's best for them and learn to put everything else outside of your mind. Um, and then try to find somebody who gets it, whether that is your spouse, whether it is another friend who's homeschooling and only, whether it is a mom who is homeschooling and only on social media that you reach out to, whether it's me, if you have absolutely nobody else, I will always be that person for anybody. And I say this because I found it really hard. I still find it really hard to complain about a bad day to a mom who's homeschooling three or four because even though I don't always hear, yeah, but at least you're not having to do it times four, you feel guilty because they're having to do it times four. And so there was a lot of time when we first started homeschooling when I didn't ever complain to anybody because I felt like I couldn't. Um, because, well, I'm only homeschooling one. I have it easier, right? Like that's what I was told. That's what I thought. You don't, it's not easier. It's different. It's a totally different dynamic. You should be able to vent to anybody, but you should have somebody that you can talk to who gets it, who knows what it's like, like that specific struggle. So if you have nobody else, I will be that person. 
Uh, question number eight, have you found any resources or communities specifically helpful for homeschooling an only child? To date, I have not found any like homeschooling an only child community um, outside of specific people on social media. In fact, I recently just did a collaboration with a handful of my favorite people who share on social media who also homeschool an only child. So I will link that collaboration up here for you guys in case you're looking for other um, people who are homeschooling and only. Uh, but other than that, as far as resources, I would say, honestly, hands down, my top resource for homeschooling and only has always been single player games because it is like something I can throw at her when I need five minutes. And it was something I could throw at her when I needed five minutes when she was little. And it's still something I can throw at her when I need five minutes now that she's in middle school. Question nine, how do you encourage independence in learning and outside of learning? Um, this is something that we have really been working towards this year specifically as she's like, you know, preteen and going into middle school. Uh, I give her a to-do list each day. I make it super simple. It's just on a spiral notebook. She got to decorate it with stickers. And like, this is what she has to have done before she can do um, like anything that she wants to do for herself, specifically screens or whatever it is that she wants to do. That's how we're giving her independence in school, like in her lessons, um, because I don't care what order she does her independent stuff in. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't care if she's doing it at 10 o'clock at night. That's on her. That just means she didn't get to spend the rest of the day doing the things she would have liked to have done. So I don't care if she gets up at six o'clock in the morning and has it done, you know, before I even wake up. She has that as her list of things that she can do. Um, and she gets to be the boss of how it gets done. Um, but when she was younger, the thing that we started doing so that she would kind of like learn to be by herself and play by herself and not necessarily be dependent on me entertaining her 24 seven, um, was strewing. And that is something I started. She may have even been in preschool. I'm not sure. She was really young because I remember strewing like sensory bins, um, puzzles, Legos, uh, building blocks, like wooden blocks. And it was something I've done for years. And it started as a way for me to have like five minutes of peace in the morning because she would wake up like 900 miles an hour ready to go. And I am a night owl and not a morning person. And I was like, please don't talk to me and leave me alone <laughs> for five minutes. Like I couldn't human and be a good parent or I mean, you know, be an engaged parent and I needed to caffeinate. So I started strewing and she knew that I would leave something out for her every night before I'd gone to bed the night before and she could do whatever she wanted with it. So sometimes I would leave like craft kits that I would get. Um, when she was really young, like the paint with water things, she loved those. Um, as she's gotten older, it's been like single player games. I still leave out puzzles for her. Um, it's more advanced craft kits now, like instead of maybe like glue this on this, it's knitting or um, perler beads have been a favorite for a very long time. Uh, sometimes I will leave out a new app on her tablet. Um, sometimes I leave out the discovery decks. It just kind of depends on what she's into. Sometimes it'll just be a stack of books, but that was always a way to like get five minutes of peace um, and encourage her to independently um, seek out engaging herself. So it was maybe five minutes when she was really little, maybe 10 minutes when she was like eight, nine, and 10. And then it's just kind of grown from there. Now I can get 20 to 30 minutes, depending on what I've strewed out of her, where she just doesn't even need me or talk to me or ask questions. At the end, she always wants to show me what she did. So eventually she does still want to be like, Hey, let me show you this. But for the most part, strewing really, really did lead to independence. Um, and then a to-do list has really helped as well. And it's like I said, just basic. Like it's literally just a notepad, nothing fancy. Um, and question number 10, what is the very best part about homeschooling and only? I think the best part about homeschooling and only is probably um, the connection and our relationship. I mean, sometimes that can be a struggle because it's only her and I, so we can butt heads more. But I also think the fact that it is just her and I means that we're developing probably 
like such a deep relationship and connection. Um, and homeschool gets to be so much fun because I get to quite literally design the education of her dreams because it's just her, right? Like I'm not trying to cater to multiple kids. So if she has an interest, I can stop what I'm doing, drop everything and write a unit study around that interest, which I have been doing for years for her. Um, I mean, it started when she was six and she came to me and was like, mommy, I would like to do Jack and Annie school. And that meant she wanted to do school based around the passport. I mean, based around the magic school, the magic treehouse books, which became our passport to adventures. Um, at eight, she wanted to go to Hogwarts and do Harry Potter school. And so I was able to stop everything I was doing. And that became our Waldox Wizards and Wands. And that's what I have been able to do for years for her. And so for me, being able to like tailor design her homeschool and her education and then like foster that connection and relationship, hands down is the best. Not to mention the experiences that we're afforded because we're a smaller family. So because we can afford to do it, because there's less of us, because it's easier to, you know, pack one child up and go versus multiple. Um, that has made it pretty amazing because we kind of live a fly by the seat of your pants um, lifestyle as far as like, if we want to go, we're just going to go. Um, in fact, my stepmom just asked me a few days ago, like, were we, how long were we going to be home? It's kind of the joke. We just got back from our road trip. She's like, so how long are you going to be home this time? And I was like, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe through the holidays, maybe not because we really could just decide, Hey, let's go to Disney tomorrow and we'll just pack up and go. Or I told Kevin jokingly, like, Hey, you know, I would kind of like to see New York at Christmas time. And like, that could mean that we pack up and go. We might, we might not, who knows. But that's the lifestyle that we live. And it's greatly because we're homeschooling an only child that we're able to do that. Because I definitely can't imagine doing that with four or five. Like, it would stress me out. I couldn't design tailor curriculum for each of them, for each of their interests. I would try. Um, but it would have to be like, okay, we're going to do for you now and then you and then you, you know, and kind of rotating through. But she gets a tailor made education to whatever she's interested in. Um, we get to be one on one. We get to really, really like foster that connection and that relationship. And we get to just kind of go and do. And it's, it's amazing. Like, I know that I have a lot of blog posts and YouTube videos talking about um, the challenges of homeschooling only because there are a lot. But the amazingness of it totally outweighs the challenges. So if you are watching this because you are wanting to homeschool and only or thinking about homeschooling and only, just do it. You're going to love it. It may be challenging at first, but it's absolutely amazing. If you have a question about homeschooling and only that I didn't answer, leave it down in the comments and I'll make sure that I get you an answer as soon as possible.